For us, it was really simple. We weren't really making a Batman movie. We're making a Chris Nolan movie. So as you likely know, based upon all of the chatter online about this documentary, a new documentary has been unveiled regarding the creation of the Dark Knight trilogy. And it's really, really a fantastic documentary. It's about an hour and 15 minutes long, and it features the likes of Zack Snyder, producer on the Dark Knight trilogy, Chuck Rovin. It features David Goyer, who wrote the movie quite controversially. Uh, it also has Guillermo del Toro for some reason, but that's cool. You know, sure, he's cool. And also Chris Nolan was interviewed throughout the entire thing. And they really delve into the creation of the Dark Knight trilogy and some of the challenges they faced along the way. And in this video, I'm going to run down five things about the Dark Knight trilogy and the way in which it was created that we just learned about a week ago when this documentary dropped online. And as soon as it did, I watched it right away. And I really, really do highly recommend it. So I'll have it linked in the description below if you want to check out the full thing. All right, let's get right into it. Number one. To hear that uh, Christopher Nolan was doing it, you know, that made me very excited much more so than if a director who was known for doing fantasy films had picked up the franchise and run with it. Chris Nolan did not know when making Batman Begins that he was going to get a sequel, which is incredible to think about because Batman Begins is a clear origin story, and in the documentary they discuss that Chris Nolan knew from the very beginning that he wanted this film to be a origin story. However, at the end of the film in Batman Begins, of course, there is a tease for the Joker with the Joker card, and then it progresses very easily into the Dark Knight with Heath Ledger's Joker portrayal, so it seems like it was planned all along, but in reality, they admit in the documentary that Chris Nolan did not know that he was going to get a second film or even a trilogy that was not a guarantee, and to his understanding, he only had the green light to make this first movie. So, the fact that he in included the Joker card at the end was very, very fantastic sequel bait for a sequel that wasn't even approved yet, and I imagine that that play also really helped him get greenlit for a sequel, besides the fact that the movie performed well at the box office. But let's really analyze the math and put it in perspective here. Batman Begins, which was released in 2005, made $373 million at the box office, which sounds like a lot, but it really is not in the grand scheme of things. For instance, Batman v Superman earned over $800 million, but you might be saying, well, it's 2005 with inflation and everything like that. The value of the dollar has appreciated, and that is true. In today's money, $373 million is equal to $496 million. But once again, putting in context, this is still substantially lower than any blockbuster film would earn today. It certainly did well, and I'm not saying that by any means, but again, putting it in context is important. The Dark Knight earned much, much more than that. And take a film like Titanic, for instance, which earned $2.195 billion at the box office. That movie was released in 1997. And in today's money, that $2.1 billion is equal to $3.5 billion. So when you really compare, Batman Begins was a financial success. Do not get me wrong in any way, but it didn't really compare to what The Dark Knight did. So I could certainly imagine a world in which a movie today comes out and makes $500 million at the box office and doesn't get a sequel. So I think that it is silly to look at this point on my list and be like, well, duh, he didn't know he was going to get a sequel. That's how Hollywood works. But of course, he knew in the back of his head he was going to get one. I really do not think it was that much of a guarantee. 500 million bucks at the box office is nothing to scoff at, but this is Batman we're talking about here. But of course, we can thank our overlords at Warner Brothers for overlooking the moderate box office success of Batman Begins and greenlighting The Dark Knight, which for many of us is our favorite comic book movie of all time. And speaking of that, let's get into a fun fact about The Dark Knight. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Heath was somebody I'd met with over the years for, for different roles. Indeed, I'd, I'd met him for Batman at the same time as I met, you know, every actor in town. He explained why he didn't want to do something like that. He was very polite about it, but uh, very clear. So you heard that right. Chris Nolan first scouted Heath Ledger, the actor who portrayed the Joker in the Dark Knight trilogy, to play Batman at first, and he turned down the role. Now, I'm curious to know in the comment section below, give me your thoughts on if you could envision Heath Ledger playing Batman in this trilogy. I think one of the tricky things is that we know him so well as the Joker, he's so recognizable and iconic that we look at the Batman and we're like, well, obviously Christian Bale has to play Batman. There's no way that Heath Ledger could have played Batman and it just looks weird. But then they also address in the documentary, looking back, the reveal of Heath Ledger as the Joker, and it was met with a lot of mixed reception. A lot of people thought, oh, this was the gay cowboy from that cowboy movie. You know, how is this guy playing the Joker? It doesn't make any sense. A lot of people were furious and thought that the Joker looked terrible. And of course, he went on to be the best live action Joker to ever 
play the role. And it's just one of those things where we always, our first gut reaction for everyone that does a great job in their role in comic book movies is, this person is not fit for the role. It even happened with Ben Affleck to a lesser extent with Christian Bale, happened with Heath Ledger and the Joker. So it's just very, very common. And maybe the lesson to be learned is that we cannot judge somebody's interpretation of a character and their role until after we see the movie. That is certainly the case with Heath Ledger and Ben Affleck's Batman as well. Even if you don't like the direction that they took Batman in the Snyderverse and the DCEU, you can't lie and you cannot deny that Ben Affleck did a fantastic job in the role. And the same is true with Heath Ledger, even though he was first cast as Batman. As for why he turned it down, he just wasn't interested. He didn't think he was a good fit. And I love the idea that Heath Ledger went to Chris Nolan and knew exactly what he wanted to do with the character. They had a long discussion and saw perfectly eye to eye. So even though he wasn't a good fit for Batman, he found a role that he was really good fit for. And he had a strong vision of how he was going to portray the character. And it's obvious in the method acting that he utilized to bring that character to life that he had a very strong vision of what he wanted that character to look like and he went to such great lengths to bring it to life and it was just a phenomenal performance it's one of the greatest performances ever done in a live action film and I strongly genuinely do believe that all right getting into number three Christopher Nolan went to absolutely insane lengths to hide the ending of The Dark Knight Rises I will just let him explain it for you the problem with the, the filmmaking process is it, it has to be done behind closed doors and it has to be done privately because you have to you know, put on a magic show in a sense. You have to rehearse and figure it out, do it from the mirror all around, and then present it to, to people. And if you're letting them see how you're doing things, the relationship between you know the audience and the performers gets distorted. We've done various things over the years to keep them secret under wraps. Probably the most extreme was with the funeral scene for Bruce Wayne. I knew that we couldn't really have the art department make up the correct name on the, on the gravestone because that would have been just too hard to keep under wraps. So we just went with a different name and used visual effects to change it. We went as far as having Christian there on set that day so that he would appear on the call sheet in case the call sheet leaked, in case there were you know, long lens shots of, of the funeral, he would be there as a, as a character as well. It was a little confusing for Michael Caine when he first <laughs> arrived on set and Christian standing next to him at his own funeral. So yes, you heard that right. Christopher Nolan, the guy known to not use CGI, used CGI on the tombstone to make it seem as though Bruce Wayne was not the one who actually died in the movie. And then in post-production, he transposed Bruce Wayne's name over the tombstone. On top of that, he had Christian Bale come to set that day, even though he was not in any scene so that he was on the call sheet. And if the call sheet were to leak, it was like, okay, Christian Bale is on set. He is in this scene. He's on the call sheet. He's on set this day for this funeral scene. So nobody knew that it was actually Bruce Wayne's funeral that all of the cast was attending. And the fascinating thing about this, of course, is that Bruce Wayne doesn't even die in the movie. So even if that had leaked, it's still a bit of a misdirection in terms of the fact that in the final end credit scene of the movie, it's basically unveiled that Bruce Wayne is in fact alive with Selena Kyle as he looks across the table at that French coffee shop and sees Alfred across the way. And it's very much so a happy ending. It is certainly not like Inception. Many people have tried to make it out to be like, oh, we don't know what happens at the end of the movie. Is he alive? Is he not? I don't know. To me, it is very clear at the end of The Dark Knight Rises that Bruce Wayne is alive, just like at the end of Batman Arkham Knight. It's very obvious that Bruce Wayne and Batman is alive. Batman never really dies, and of course, uh, The Dark Knight Rises is no exception. But even still, it would have been disastrous if it had leaked that Bruce Wayne has a funeral scene and people think that he's dead, and then at the end of the movie when he is driving off into the sunset with the bomb, you know, you're basically like, okay, I know what's going to happen. I know it's going to blow up and he's going to be presumed to be dead and maybe he'll live. Maybe he won't. Going back to the ending of The Dark Knight Rises, I don't want to play the clip so as not to get, you know, demonetized or whatever. But at the end of the movie, there's a character who says to Lucius Fox and they basically are like, yo, you know, by the way, the Batwing had the autopilot fixed on it a couple of months ago or a couple of weeks ago. And that, of course, was clearly implying that Bruce Wayne somehow escaped from the nuclear explosion. It's amazing that Chris Nolan puts that line in there and people are still like, no, he's dead. You know, uh, like it's it's a double ending and nobody knows and it's open ended and we don't really know what happened at the end. It's like, dude, that line was planted in there <laughs> to make it very clear that, hey, autopilot was turned on. Bruce Wayne was able to navigate away while autopilot was taking 
the bomb into the distance and, you know, uh, Batman survived. But I imagine that Batman would have felt pretty shitty about himself if he bailed and then the autopilot didn't work and then everybody died. Uh, luckily, that didn't happen, so all is good. Although tons of fish died. Like, I can't imagine the amount of fish that got blown up in that nuclear explosion. Good job, Bane. You suck. All right, fun fact number four. Morgan Freeman almost turned down the role of Lucius Fox. And according to Chris Nolan, he took several months to convince to actually take up the role. I'll pass it to him to explain. As I started to write the character of Lucius, I did something that I've always avoided doing in the past, really, which is I, I did write with Morgan Freeman in mind. To try and write a characterization around an actor can be limiting, and I tried not to make it limiting. I, I wrote part I hadn't seen him play before, but I knew that I really wanted him in there, and I pursued him for many, many months. Whatever he tells you now, he was very difficult to convince. And she flew to Memphis to meet with him in, in person and really explain why the part needed him. And uh, eventually he's, he said yes and turned up. Hang on one second. Okay, door shut, please, Morgan. We're shut the doors. But I was, I was quite relieved when he actually turned up to shoot because I'd begun to believe that what was never going to happen. But uh, I, I managed to get him in the end. Now, I'm not sure what prompted Chris Nolan to really craft this role around Morgan Freeman. Not that Morgan Freeman is not a fantastic actor. He obviously is. And I think that he was the right person for the role. But at the same point, the type of thing where you write a role around an actor before that actor is guaranteed to be in that role is something that amateur filmmakers do. It's something that's very common in sort of more corporate Hollywood. But for a filmmaker, and I think there's a difference between somebody who makes movies and someone who's a filmmaker, Chris Nolan is very clearly a filmmaker filmmaker and as a result of that it's very rare for somebody with like Chris Nolan to basically craft a role around an actor before that actor is even committed to it and as he mentioned it puts you in a precarious position because let's say you go to Morgan Freeman and he says no in that time when he was saying no for three months he probably was picking up on the fact that Chris Nolan was very desperate to have him in the film and as a result of that that probably aided his salary negotiations and it just can sometimes fall through I mean actors have so many things going on and you don't want to bank on just one person but I'm glad that it worked out and in the end, Morgan Freeman did a fantastic job in the role, obviously. Having Michael Caine playing Alfred and having Morgan Freeman playing Lucius, it just provided that really, really high quality buffer around Bruce Wayne because I feel like in many previous films, the emphasis is placed solely on Bruce Wayne and the actor playing him and obviously um, some of his supporting cast is not as built out obviously excluding Batman 1989 there was a lot of really great character development for Gordon and Alfred and characters like that but I thought in this film in particular and in the entire Dark Knight trilogy they really did a fantastic job at building out his ensemble cast which is ironic because this is one of the Batman movies that totally avoids having the Bat family Robin Batgirl Nightwing and characters like this so it's certainly not an ensemble movie but the ensemble cast around Bruce Wayne and Batman is quite good All right our fifth and final fun fact about the Dark Knight Rises is one that I felt was one of the more interesting of the five and that is that Gary Oldman almost played Ra's al Ghul in Batman Begins Gary Oldman, who played Commissioner Gordon in the Batman Dark Knight trilogy, he was actually cast to play Ra's al Ghul. I met with Gary for Ra's al Ghul, for Ducard originally, because he's an actor I admired so tremendously, and I wanted to get him in the film. Action! Flash! Flash! Do it! He had played a lot of villains, and he wasn't really interested in, in playing another villain in, in our film. I mean, he, he met with me, and we got on very well. But something wasn't sitting right with him about being, you know, the villain in the Batman film. So I called him a few days later and just completely changed direction. I said, what about, you know, got this great character of Commissioner Gordon. All right, now here is my final question for you that I want you all to leave in the comments section below. What is your ranking of the Dark Knight trilogy? I think for many people that are going to rank the Dark Knight, obviously at number one. I would certainly agree anyone that does not put the Dark Knight at number one, I would argue is honestly insane. Although a couple people do put Batman Begins over the Dark Knight, I would not agree with that ranking. For me, it goes Dark Knight. And then number two is actually the Dark Knight Rises. Now the thing with the Dark Knight Rises is I find it to be incredibly underrated. I thought that Tom Hardy as Bane was so good and he compensated for some of the flaws of the movie. Additionally, Hans Zimmer has one of his best outings ever in the history of his filmography with uh, making such an incredible score. I mean, the whole Rise theme and the way that the music and score complemented the cinematography and action. It also is one of the better action movies 
scenes that Chris Nolan has ever made. Even the scene where all of the cops clash with the uh, militia members and towards the end of the film, I mean, it has hundreds and hundreds of extra extras. It's just something that we haven't really seen in any prior Batman movie. I thought that The Dark Knight Rises is severely underrated, and uh, number three on my list, obviously, is Batman Begins, which is also an incredible movie, but just my least favorite of the three. So in the comment section below, I'm very curious to know, where do you rank all of these movies? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Shout out to all of my elite members. They pay $10 a month and are a huge help to the channel and allow me to do what I do here every single day. So check the link in the description below if you'd like to become an elite member of the channel. Or um, I also have membership tiers for 2 and $5, so check those out as well. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and ring the bell, and I will see you guys in the next video.